Greetings, Marsh here, and welcome to episode 2 of my Industrial Revolution 3 playthrough. In this episode, we are going to start some research, as well as set up some of the new logistics features of IR3. Enjoy. Well, technically, we have enough to start working on these science packs. However, it would be nice if we automated this, at least to the extent that we can. Keep grabbing coal out of this, because this is one machine we essentially want to always be full. But we now have an idea for the ratio of machines here. So let's move these out of the way. And that's at the bottom. So some things we can make are transport belts and they are rubber colored, but they don't use rubber, at least not these ones. Nonetheless, they're still kind of expensive and lots of intermediate parts, which makes it take forever. But that's how it is. All right, well, we could probably just uh, move this out of the way now. Let's just start it right here. Put three more. And as far as inserters, you could use steam inserters and you start out with regular burner inserters and the steam inserters, which use the same amount of power. So the pollution is going to be the same. However, you also have access to a long handed inserter, but it must run on steam. So it's nice that at the beginning of the game, you have long handed inserters, but it is not an option to make them burner. And in this situation, making them a burner makes sense because we already need to put fuel into these buildings to make them work. So why not just make the inserter a burner and also it will grab its fuel. If we did not need to put fuel in the building, well then uh, maybe it would make more sense. And uh, one more thing you can't move is transport belts. So you do have to pick those up specifically because I need to move these over. But let's make five burner inserters and you see lots of items go into each one of these and uh, get used to it. There we go. And then this one will also need its own inserter. And one additional one. And a chest for the fuel. And we'll have to fill that up by hands, but at least now we are not filling up all oh, these machines, and I put that on the wrong side, unfortunately. I'm not using Bob's adjustable inserters for this. Since it feels like a vanilla-like mod pack, I feel that uh, using Bob's adjustable inserters is a little much. You really don't need them. I mean, they're nice for making very interesting builds, but ultimately, you can survive just fine without them. You just perhaps have difficulty thinking about what it would be like because it's been so long since you've been using them, but uh, you can get by without them just fine. And in fact, it makes placing inserters a lot easier and quicker when you don't have to think about how you would adjust them. But we'll just let this run. And now we have automated copper production to the maximum speed of one burner drill. And although we probably don't need it for tin, let's go ahead with it. And since we no longer have any resource limitations as far as iron and tin go, I am fine with now picking up these junk piles. And if you see what we're going to get, it's going to be a lot of junk. It would have helped in the beginning for handcrafting, but I just like to start with nothing. Most of these items you'll recognize. However, the new thing is copper scrap and tin scrap. And that is something we will deal with a little later. But for now, there'll be junk items in our inventory. So where was everything else? Let's see, the second one was here. And the third one was in here somewhere. There we go. Also, we might as well pick this chest up. If we remove it, we won't uh, get a chest, but since we can already handcraft the shells, why not just uh, grab them anyway? Same with a shotgun. Mining drills, I'll still wait a little bit on that, but making stone furnaces is pretty straightforward. So I'll just grab those. All right, so we have another thing we want to build. We might as well make a copy of this. We don't have robots, but what we want to build is essentially the same thing. So at least we can have a plan there, and I guess it does not let you slide it over. A ghost, I suppose that makes sense. And that's probably going to be way more tin than we're going to need for the time being. These torches are about halfway to running out, but uh, should be fine for now. We've got other things we can make here, but at this point I think we have automated our production of materials enough to the point to where we can make our copper analysis packs, or just call them red packs, and do our first research. And there's lots of things we can get started on, and in fact we'll probably want to do 
several different ones all to start with. But for now, usually the first thing you want to do is automation because handcrafting things sucks. That'll give us the steam assembler, which can make anything. And it's, although the graphics are different, the size and functionality is the same as a vanilla assembler. The exception, this one requires steam to operate. Also a unique aspect of IR3 is that there is a small steam assembler that you get that is a one by one assembling machine that assembles only basic components, basically all of that junk. So having a one by one assembler creates interesting issues when it comes to logistically inserting items into it. I'm sure that Bob's adjustable inserters would make it a lot easier, but in this situation, we're not going to use it. Also, it gives us the ability to have steam cells, which are like early game batteries, and it won't take very long for us to want to use them. But we can make the empty cell with copper items, and then you use this steam pipe interface to either fill up steam cells or drain steam cells. And we'll get that started even though nothing will happen. And one interesting thing is that all armors in IR3 have an equipment grid, even the light armor. So we have a couple of squares to use. So those steam cells will come in handy fairly quickly. All right, well, we have some things we need to do. We need our steam laboratory and you see it's also a very expensive building. So we'll get that started now. This is our first machine that we're using that must use steam. And there's two ways to going about it depending on how you want to go about it. One, they have an early game copper boiler, which you can just put coal in and you get steam on the output. However, they do give you this steam fissure, which is a permanent output of steam. And yes, it starts at 100% yield, but after it goes down to a certain point, it just rebounds back up to 100%. So it's an infinite resource that constantly runs in cycles. And I guess they were worried that it would be too much work to automate delivery of steam from like water over here or something. It's not even really that far away, especially because we have this little pool right here. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me about why it's there because it's essentially free energy for basically the entire game, even though the further you go, the less and less useful that resource actually becomes. Man, those graphics are just so cool in here where you see like the sparks coming up. Same with the mining drill too. It's just very steampunky. But uh, it's there and I imagine most people that would play IR3 would probably want to use it. So in order to get that steam, you need a steam derrick. And the convenient thing about it is that it is stealth powering. So it requires no energy at all. You just place it down and it makes steam for you. And of course, it's an expensive building. We're going to need to do this research somewhere where kind of depends on what we decide for our main bus and we'll get into that later but you don't want to go nuts in iron 3 doing huge main buses until mid game nonetheless though you need some kind of area and it looks like we could go either up or to the side going up would not require us cutting down an entire forest of trees but there is a bunch of water there and we're not going to have landfill yet so i think we have to go to the right and cut down a bunch of trees so how about we claim this area right here for our lab. So we'll place it and steam buildings tend to have lots of steam connections everywhere. And another thing we're going to need is to get that steam up there. And you have lots of choices of pipes. One thing that's important to note is that pipes that hold water and pipes that hold steam are different pipes. So you need to use the correct pipe. Also IR3 has built in valves and you can, if you read the uh, description there, hold Shift and E, which is the hotkey for IR3 to change the functionality of various items that do have multiple functionalities. Also, you have two forms of underground pipes. One is the normal length of 10, and the other one is a short one that only goes to five. And that short one can make builds that have lots of underground significantly cheaper if they don't need to have a long underground length. But in this situation, we should probably just do the long undergrounds of these steams because we have to move the steam pretty far and also you have a copper offshore pump so here's the steam derrick and i don't know if we're going to be able to jump over all of that or not but i guess we don't have a choice so we'll put it there and now the steam goes away because it's being saved and you see the expected resources it starts at 60 a second so that's a lot of steam for the beginning of the game but you know 60 steam is nothing before too long so although this is a nice help it doesn't contribute that much in the long run I'm guessing this pipe is not going to reach. Nope, so we might as well make one short one to save some resources here. 
but it starts at 60 a second and then it goes down to about five or 10 or so. And then once it hits that point, it just snaps back up to 60 a second again until it goes down. So it's kind of weird how it works like that, but uh, it is a nice resource to have. Oh yeah, I needed to uh, self fuel our burner drill here. We will have a way of automating this quite easily in a moment, so we won't be hand inserting things for much longer. So here's the short pipe. You see it does not go very far, but it is cheaper. And then we'll use the long one to hop over everything. Guess we might as well just chop these trees down. If we build a little mini bus here, then they are going to be in the way anyway. Luckily though, having our personal robots aren't that far away. We will get them pretty quickly, so we won't have to just sit here and right-click for minutes at a time. And we need some packs. I believe you can power three labs with the uh, speed of your handcrafting. So let's try that. There we go. Steam is delivered. And we'll throw the pack in there. And <laughs> it's like a planetarium. And it makes really cool clicking noises. Hopefully you find them cool and not annoying. It's pretty slow in the beginning and it can only take the first two packs. The next one is the iron pack. We basically have a functioning factory now. It's not completely automated. Because we do have to come in here and fill things up with coal from time to time. But other than that, it's reasonably automated for the beginning of the game. And it ran out. Probably should have made a couple more packs to start with. It is nice being able to uh, queue things to the front real quick. So you don't have to just erase all of the things that you have planned. Because uh, it's not really a plan, but we've got a lot of handcrafting to do. I think I'm going to go through and put a couple of pieces of coal in each one of these torches to hopefully make them last until we have some lights. Since we have a surplus of coal now, it's not that big a deal to have a lot of it sitting in stasis stuck in these torches. Okay, lab number two. And now we have a couple extra packs for them. So yeah, we'll work on the last lab. And after that, I'm pretty sure about three labs is a pretty good ratio for your uh, handcrafting. Ah, it's so satisfying to have our early game factory automated now. It's not much, but it still feels like an accomplishment nonetheless. Which is why I like to start from nothing, because it just feels a little better. And you can see after doing a little bit of crafting, we have completely used up all of those extra resources that they gave us. And now we're just down to the scraps. So they give you a little bit to get started, but it doesn't take very long for all that to just disappear. But I like starting from nothing because then it just feels better when you've got a little bit of automation going. And you can see after running for a while, this Derek is now down to 59.6 steam a second. So the faster you use it up, the faster it's going to go down. And just about to run out of packs again. So it does seem like about three of them is what you can maintain. And number three. And yep, the science packs are about to run out here. I guess this will be our first test to fill up all three with science packs and then see how long they last and if the next science packs are ready in time. Looks like we are building them a little faster than three labs worth, but it's pretty close. So maybe we could get by with four of them if we really wanted to. But if we were building any other handcrafting items, it wouldn't really work. But yeah. <laughs> there we go. We now have automation. And what we research next kind of depends on what our next goal is. We do want to build a little mini bus, yes, but we need to resist building a vanilla style bus where you just put every item you can make on a bus at the same time because a lot of these items are not going to have any use in the mid game or the late game. So it's kind of pointless to put them on a bus, not to mention we just can't produce resources very fast anyway. So the mini bus we want to make is just enough so we don't have these huge crafting queues like this. So just enough of a bus to where this crafting queue is greatly reduced. And although we do have the tools now to make it, there are some things that would help here. And of this, we probably want to have logistics as well. Having underground belts and of course having splitters will help. 
And also it gives us access to these transfer plates, which is really useful. And it's also a unique IR3 item. And we will talk about that when we get them set up. That is a critical part of the early game of IR3 is using these transfer plates. And one other thing we probably should grab is the early game robots. We don't really need them for the purposes of building our minibus. However, there's a lot of trees there. So having robots to clear them out for us uh, would be really nice. So of course, robots are just a copper item and you get two steam roboports, which go into your inventory and each one can support a tiny five robots and it is supplied on steam cells. It does not get power from electricity or anything else, only steam. And keeping this field up is much easier if you use these transfer plates. So we definitely want all of these together. However, that is a 20 item research. So we have a little bit of research to do another 30 items. But that's fine. Maybe we can build a few more of these steam labs if we get ahead on the science packs here. And it seems like we are, so let's grab another one. We could use an assembler to make these packs right now, but there's kind of no point because we're just about to build a mini bus that will do the same thing. So let's use the bus that has everything in the same spot rather than having all these little assemblers all over the place. Yeah, we'd probably just about be maxed out on handcrafting if we had four of these. Probably don't need to have this filling itself up pretty high like that. In fact, having um, like three stacks ought to be good. So let's use a tin pallet. So we plop that in there. We pick up the items we uh, needed to. But otherwise, now we have a flat chest that we can walk over and it holds three stacks and we don't have to worry about limiting it. Okay, we've got logistics now. Of course, undergrounds and splitters are things you're probably aware of, but the new thing here are the transfer plates. So let's cover how the inventory system works in IR3. To make the plates, they are a tin item. So let's make a big one and a small one. And it's nice to put them in the front. Maybe I should leave it at front all of the time, but sometimes you do want stuff to go into the back. So this gives you access to these plates that have a certain range to them. And because I added the color onto these items in the mod settings, they stand out a little more than if they were just a dark gray plate. There is a tiny difference to the plate range, but I think each one has essentially the same range. It's just since the two by two is one square smaller, it reaches one square less distance. But ultimately I like to use the two different types of plates to use different functions. And looks like we just ran out of science here. But we're just about to make more. But how I use the plates are the big plates are the ones that I want to step on. And the little plates are the ones that I have to think about if I should step on. <laughs> so that will make sense in a second. So what in the world do these plates actually do? Let's put a tin chest down here and also put a plate. So if you want the inventory system to work correctly, all of the chests that you're going to interact with need to be within the range of the plate. And the plates do have a reasonable range here. So this works two ways. We can take items out of our inventory, then we can put items into the inventory. And we use filters for this. So for example, let's say this was the chest that was supplying coal. I guess we have more packs to throw in there. Probably should keep up the handcrafting. What you can do is middle click any of your inventory slots and put a filter on it. So let's set that to coal. So basically what you're saying is, is I want coal in this slot. Now, of course, if you had coal in your inventory, it would automatically go there because it's a filtered slot. But how this works with the transfer plate is these are essentially inventory requests. So if you walk on a plate and you don't have a resource that is filtered like this and it is available in a nearby chest, it will automatically place them in there. So now you have it. And that is how inventory transfers work in IR3. I like to call it drive-by logistics <laughs> because you essentially can do this without even really thinking about it, where we're just handling other things. We walk over this plate and it's done. Also, it doesn't stop with the character. You could do this with vehicles too. So you could drive a car over this and have the resources transferred. But also, let's say instead of an item that we wanted, 
there is an item we didn't want in our inventory. How would that work? Well, you can do the same thing with chests as with your inventory where you can set a filter, but there is a shortcut for this up at the top here. So if you select, let's say coal there, it will fill every slot inside that chest, saving you that effort. So now if we walk over this, it completely removes every piece of coal in our inventory because it was trying to fill up this chest. So let's say the chest only had four slots in it and we walked over it, it would fill up the four, leaving what we have available. So with these transfer plates, you can do a lot of rudimentary logistics, which will greatly simplify a lot of this handcrafting in the beginning. Because yes, you have all these parts you have to make, but you don't necessarily need to do a huge bus with all these items. You can simply use your own inventory to transfer items between machines. And this stays pretty useful all the way up until the point where you have robot logistics. So when it comes to these transfer plates, you need to think about what situations would I want to deliver or receive items on a regular basis, and which ones would I want to do them only in certain situations. So I like to use these small plates for the certain situations one. And right now we already have some junk in our inventory, coal, wood, and stone. We're going to get that as a result of clearing trees and rocks out of the way, and our inventory will get clogged with them. And instead of having to manually place them in chests, we can use these transfer plates to automate their removal. So to do so, first we need to have a chest, which we'll put down. We'll just go to the inventory filter here, which will set the filter for the entire chest so we don't have to just copy it over and say, we want coal. And then do the small plate to signify that it is a junk plate that sometimes we want to step on and sometimes we don't. But we go there, and that now places the coal onto that belt. Looks like we're done with the robots, but let's make some transport belts here for now. Initially, I was expecting on this save to use the drive-by logistics with the character in order to deliver coal to these various machines, because normally they're very far away from each other. Like right now they're all jumped together, but usually you'd have like one here, one here, one there. And in the beginning of the game, building enough belts to connect all those to your coal patch requires an obnoxious amount of materials. It's just not worth it. So I was expecting on this playthrough to be running around using our inventory as a mule to deliver coal to various machines. But in this situation, it looks like we don't actually need to do that because everything is so close together. Just know that you would use these transfer plates to do that. But that's not really required here. So now any coal that we find in our inventory, like we just picked up, we'll just walk over that plate and get rid of it. And we have undergrounds and splitters. So now we can deliver this coal pretty easily. Just need to make sure it's on the right side of the belt. And I didn't even intend to walk on the plate there, but it still got rid of the coal. So definitely whenever you're placing these, you need to make sure that you put it in such a way that makes sense to you. Otherwise, you might be accidentally doing inventory transfers when you don't mean to. And uh, I guess we could do some more inventory transfers that you can even see how much resources it takes just to make a short belt like this. It takes quite a bit. So we are short on tin and ingots and certainly we could pick them up out of the machine. But why do that when we have logistics now with these transfer plates? So we'll put one down in range and this is a please step on me plate so I'll make it the big one. And we don't need to have a bunch of ingots in reserve here. So how about we just make four plates and we can use the burner inserters for this because they will leach the fuel out of the stone furnace. And there we go. We don't need to worry about limiting the output because we use the wooden pellets and they only have a stack size of one. And let's say for our inventory we want to carry, doesn't really matter, but let's say two stacks of copper and it automatically placed it there to sort our inventory. And how about two stacks of tin? Well now, when we walk over this, it's automatically going to pick up items as they are available to fill up our inventory. And you see it keeps going. It doesn't do it instantly, but it is constantly checking when you're standing on the plate. And it's cool how it shows you exactly what happened in that indicator. But now we have our 200. So anytime we need copper, even if we don't need copper, when we're walking by, we'll just walk over the plate and make what we need. So like right here, we're not even really thinking about it, but we have now just replenished what we spent. 
I'll eventually get these uh, toolbars sorted, but for now it's not too important. So this is a situation where when you're deciding on if you should use burner inserters or steam inserters, it kind of depends on the availability of fuel. If you're in a situation like this where fuel is readily available, then the burner inserters are probably the easier solution here because you just place them and they work. The only time you'd want to use the steam ones is if you needed the long-handed inserters. So let's put it in here and make sure that it can reach all of them. Put the inserter in there and now as we stand on this plate, it will keep grabbing more and filling up our inventory. So now as we handcraft things, it'll automatically get filled in. Well, we're just at the point of almost having robots here. So how about we complete this with some robots? So researching this gave us the ghost rebuild timeout, of course, because we now have access to robots. But there's a couple things we need to set up here. It is in combat where first we need to have our two roboports and they have a limit of five robots each and a 15 by 15 construction area, so quite small and they can recharge two robots at the same time and they're recharging them with steam. And because we're using resources so fast, it's really nice to just be able to step on these pads and not really think about it. So you can see how powerful this becomes when we can automate the production of the intermediates as well and also have them automated with these plates. So there's our first roboport. I'm surprised Vanilla Factorio doesn't do this. It's really cool to have this tiny little grid that you can immediately start using at the beginning of the game. And there we go, but you notice they have no fuel and the delivery of fuel in IR3 leans on the transfer plate system. It's got a special button the fuel manager here so you can turn it on or off right now it was off and if we turn it on it's going to start giving us warnings of no fuel available because it is trying to use fuel to fuel these up and since that fuel is not available we're going to keep getting that warning and there it goes that's what that means is the fuel is unavailable so we'll turn that off for now so what we need to do is fill up some steam canisters here and because we are handcrafting and it's going to take forever Let's just make 10 of them for now. And we need the steam pipe interface, which we can use to suck up some of the extra steam that is coming out of the steam fissure in order to fill these up. And we could do this process anywhere. We'll probably move it later to something that's a little more automated. But for now, how about we place the interface right here? And if you hover over it, this is one of the items that can be changed with shift E and what it changes is whether or not steam is going into or out of the interface. So if we hold shift and press E, you see the arrow changes. So that's telling us if it is putting steam into the system or taking steam out of the system. And we are definitely taking it out. Let's make some pallets because of course we are going to use the item logistics for this. And this is definitely a please stand here item. So. Let's make it a big panel and we'll have two pallets. And in this situation, it does not make sense to do this with burner inserters because they are running on steam only. So let's make some steam inserters. And they work essentially the same. It's just they're a little more annoying because you actually have to pipe in the steam to them. So we'll put it there and we can use the picker dollies to move steam pipes around. So we just hook them up, all the pipes are connected, and now the inserters have what they need. So on the input side, we're going to want to make a request for empty fuel cells, because if we have any empty fuel cells in our inventory, this is where they should go. And this one will supply the full steam cells. And you can see that it is now filling up the steam cells and placing them here. So if we make another request, and say we want steam cells, it will try to give us a full stack's worth. So we step on here, and now we've got steam cells. Let's put it somewhere over here just so we can see how much steam we have available. And if you hover over it, you can see that it is a three megajoule container, or in other words, like a three megajoule battery. So the energy density is actually kind of bad because coal has four megajoules in it, but it's not like these robots are going to use that much energy in the end. They take quite a while to make. That should be 10 of them. 
Well, we can turn our fuel manager on now. So when that happens, it will take these fuel cells, you see the negative 10, because it put them all directly into the RoboPorts. And now the RoboPorts have the empty fuel in them. It will automatically push the cells back out into your inventory after it doesn't need them. And now you see the warning, it was the yellow. The yellow warning means we're not out of fuel, it's just it wished it had more. So if we step on here, we'll automatically place the empty fuel cells. They will automatically be picked back up. Then the fuel manager will automatically put them into the RoboPorts. And there they go. I'm not sure what it tries to fill it up to. I guess we'll see if it gives us another warning or not. It still is, so that must mean that it wants more. So to stop it from giving us that warning, let's make another 10 cells. We'll eventually automate this. So we'll have a full stack of these at all times. But right now, that would be a lot of handcrafting for not a lot of benefit. But you can see that it is constantly going through them and filling things up. So hopefully that's good now. No more warnings. And although we don't really need to make a request for robots, it's going to be something that we're always going to have in our inventory anyway. So we might as well give them a special slot. Because that way, at a glance, we can at least see how many we have, just in case we lose one. It'll be apparent when one of the robots isn't there. Well, we only have four robots right now, but it's enough to see them in action. And they even make that clicking noise. <laughs> and you see the little steam puffs as they fill up. And let's empty that little bit of coal out. And there we go. That is how the logistics work. That's the end of this episode. On the next one, we are going to start working on our minibus, which will start making all of these intermediate items that we constantly need for our handcrafting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.